Hello and welcome class to this, the final portion of chapter 16's lecture, wherein we will be discussing Le Chatelier's Principle. So uh, Le, Ch <laughs> Le Chatelier's Principle, we are going to be discussing in really more of a qualitative way. Um, so thus far in chapter 16, we've really been focusing on how do we find our equilibrium constant quantitatively? How do we use the initial concentrations to determine which direction the reaction will go quantitatively? Uh, how do we even find equilibrium concentrations from initial concentrations quantitatively? So we're going to take a little bit of a breather here to focus really on something qualitative, a big picture. Once we are at equilibrium, how or rather, what variables, uh, when altered, will shift us away from equilibrium, and therefore, how do we get back to equilibrium? A reaction at equilibrium is not finished, right? A reaction at equilibrium is still dynamically occurring. There is still change happening from reactant to product and from product to reactant. And what this means is that that uh, reaction, if it is at equilibrium, will remain at equilibrium, reacting dynamically indefinitely until that equilibrium is disturbed. Uh, this is very similar to uh, sort of like in parallel to the concept of uh, inertia in physics, that an object, if it is sitting still, will remain sitting still until there is some type of outside force. So with no outside forces, this object will never move. It'll just sit here happy and content. With no outside forces for this second ball though, this reaction or this ball will never stop, right? It will constantly be rolling, be moving, assuming that there's no friction forever, unless something stops it. That is like what is happening with these dynamic equilibrium reactions. They will continue to occur until disturbed in some way. So what we're gonna be talking about today is what does this disturbance look like at the chemical level? and how we can predict how a disturbance is going to affect a reversible reaction, all depending on what that disturbance is. And this is all uh, underneath the umbrella then of the term Le Chatelier's principle. This is probably my favorite principle in all of physics uh, or chemistry because it is so widely applicable in like every walk of life, economically, uh, interpersonally, <laughs> that a system that is at equilibrium it is chill, it is stable, it is at its, uh, you know, reversible dynamic nature, will respond to a stress in such a way that it relieviate, or, uh, relieves or alleviates that stress and regains equilibrium. Regardless as to whether or not we are working with a reversible reaction in solution, in uh, a gaseous form that's contained in some type of reaction vessel, a reaction will remain in equilibrium until we change its concentration in some way, we change pressure or volume in some way, or we change temperature of the system. So we're going to look at each of these three components separately. How does changing concentration affect the balance of a chemical reaction? How does pressure volume uh, change the dynamic nature of this reversible reaction? And how does changing temperature affect the reversible <laughs> reaction that is a that is, uh, that is occurring? How, does, how do each of these things create stress that must be alleviated? And I'm going to do so uh, all in the context of Hot Wheels cars. Now, I like uh, this example a lot because if you've ever played with Hot Wheels cars, you would know that if you place a Hot Wheels car up at the top of this track, uh, these tracks have very little friction, and if your car itself does not have any rust in the spokes or the wheels, it will just travel in whatever direction goes from high to low, right? We are going from high potential to low potential. And that is exactly what we are doing also when relieving stress according to Le Chatelier's principle. So this will make sense as we get started, I promise. All right, so let's look at changing concentration first. If your reactant concentration is increased, your reaction will shift towards products. If your product concentration is increased, your reaction will shift towards reactants. And so you could go through the ringer if you want and memorize these facts. And the opposite is also true. If your reactant concentration is decreased, the reaction then shifts towards reactants. If your product concentration is decreased, your reaction will shift towards products. So 
Again, to reiterate, the opposite of these statements are true, but here's an easier way to think about it so you don't have to memorize anything. Let's look at this general reaction below. So we have A plus B is reacting reversibly to create C plus D. Here's our generic reaction that we have been working with uh, basically for the last two chapters. If your uh, reactant concentration is increased, so let's say here are our hypothetical uh, at equilibrium concentration levels in terms of energy, right? We are at equal energy right now. So we are at equilibrium. If we increase the amount of reactant, you are going to raise up the energy level of your reactant state. And so how this connects to the concept of our hot, or hot wheels car. So let's say we're looking at equilibrium here. Uh, let's connect these two energetic states with a hot wheels track. And we're going to put a car right in the middle of this track. Here's a little Hot Wheels car. Now, if we increase the concentration of reactant, if we increase the energy level of that reactant state, what we're going to do is raise up the Hot Wheels track on the left-hand side. Well, if we're following with this analogy, the question is, which direction will this Hot Wheels car move in? Is it going to move back towards reactants or is it gonna to shift towards products? It is going to roll down the hill, shifting towards products. So what this tells us, this analogy or this example, is that if we increase the reactant concentration, the Hot Wheels car is going to roll down the hill towards products. In other words, the Hot Wheels car, which is representing the shift of our reaction, right, here's our Hot Wheels car, representing the shift of the reaction, the Hot Wheels car is shifting towards the products. And this is a good way to, like, a good visual way to remember if you're increasing a concentration or decreasing a concentration, which direction is your reaction going to shift? Well, if you imagine these uh, initial states as being evil and the, or equal, evil, wow. If these states are equal, increasing or decreasing a reactant or product concentration is going to cause this Hot Wheels car to shift in some way. All right, let's look at the opposite situation, though, because I did say the opposites are true. If uh, we are looking at a situation where initially we have some reactant and some product, it's at equilibrium. So again, concentrations are not necessarily equal, but the forward and reverse rates are equal. We've got our track connecting these two and our Hot Wheels car is just kind of hanging out in the middle. If we decrease the amount of our reactant, and this could be done in a number of ways, either by precipitating a reactant or causing a secondary reaction, uh, the track now is going to be lower, lowering down on the reactant side. So our new track is going to look a little something like this. And our Hot Wheels car that is stationed on this track is now going to roll down towards this reactant state. In other words, if we decrease the concentration of reactant, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction is going to spontaneously shift in the reverse to create more reactant to restabilize and re-reach equilibrium. All right, so let's look at an example of this kind of dynamic shifting in a real world situation. So if we have the two reactions below and they're taking place in the same container, uh, how does the concentration or uh, and the concentration of our uh, H2O gas, which is right here, decreases due to condensation. So let's say the reaction was exothermic, the vessel heated up, but now it's cooling down. And as the H2 gas uh, is going to condense, it is changing from gaseous form to liquid form and is leaving according to this reaction state. We are decreasing the concentration of the H2O. How is this going to affect the entire system? And more specifically, what is going to change about the mass of the copper carbonate in the second reaction? Now, there are a couple of different ways that we can look at this. The first is going to be following the example uh, or analogy that we just kind of laid out. The first reaction is uh, balanced, it is at equilibrium, and we now are decreasing the concentration of our H2O. Since we are decreasing this concentration of the H2O gas, since it is being taken away, it is condensing, uh, we would expect then this Hot Wheels track as it is like currently level then to become unlevel, it is going to decrease down now towards the reactant since we are losing one of the reactants. As the Hot Wheels car then shifts, signifying that the reaction, this first reaction is going to shift 
to recreate more reactant, we are going to now be losing some product to make that happen. And here's how we can see uh, how the first reaction connects to the second reaction, because the species that is in common between the two is this carbon dioxide. Now, if the first reaction is shifting to the left to accommodate the loss of the water vapor, this carbon dioxide concentration is going to decrease. And that is going to affect the reversible nature of this second reaction because we are decreasing the concentration of the CO2 gas here. Right, the CO2 gas is the exact same in both of these reactions. These two reactions are inherently linked because of the carbon dioxide concentration, uh, because this is all happening in the same container. So if we're decreasing the carbon dioxide concentration, the same kind of thing is going to happen here, where previously the reaction was at equilibrium and now we have distressed the reaction in some way. We are removing the carbon dioxide from the second reaction, meaning that our Hot Wheels car is going to shift towards the product state, which is going to create more products as the reaction is shifting to accommodate now the first reaction as it was shifting. And if the ultimate question is, what's going to happen to the copper carbonate if the water vapor concentration is decreased? Well, here we can see the first reaction shifts to the left, which removes carbon dioxide. Our second reaction is going to shift to the right to create more carbon dioxide in response. And as this reaction shifts from left to right, we are going to lose our reactant, which is a solid here. In other words, if we lose some of this water vapor due to condensation, we are also going to ultimately decrease the mass of our copper carbonate as this copper carbonate is forced to decompose into more or creating more copper oxide and more carbon dioxide. Okay, so that is how changing the concentration can affect uh, or distress a reversible reaction. And we can also then again use that analogy of the Hot Wheels car to predict how the change in concentration is going to affect the overall reversible reaction. Now, something else to look at is uh, not all reactions uh, that are reversible take place in solution. Again, some take place in gaseous form. And since gases uh, are also connected through the ideal gas law to the concept of pressure and volume, changing the pressure and volume of gaseous reversible reactions is also going to have an effect on the reversible reaction. So the first example or the first statement here, if pressure is increased, so you're either decreasing the volume or you are condensing down, uh, you know, you're forcing these gases to come into contact more. Um, temperature is increased, what have you, according to all of our previous gas law discussions. If pressure is increased, the reaction will shift, shift towards the side with fewer moles of gas. And the reason why this happens is that shifting towards the side with fewer moles of gas is going to alleviate the increased pressure, right? So if we decrease the volume, the reaction we will see naturally uh, shift towards the side with fewer moles of gas, which will then naturally decrease the pressure of the reaction. Now, the second case is the exact opposite. So if the pressure is decreased, so we increase the volume, let's say, your reversible reaction will shift towards the side that has the greater number of moles of gas. And this is done to replenish the pressure. Uh, there's a phrase that I like to say, which is that nature hates the void. Uh, naturally occurring pockets of empty space like vacuums are very, very rare, at least on this planet. They're more common in interstellar space, but we are not looking at interstellar space. So if uh, a reaction is going to take place that is reversible and we increase the volume or we decrease the temperature, now we can imagine that there is more space to be taken up inside of the reaction vessel. And so your reaction will shift towards the side that has more stuff to fill those open spaces. So let's look at the example reaction below. We have two, uh, two moles of gas A reacting with one mole of gas B reacting reversibly to create one mole of gas C. So if we have a reaction vessel that is, let's say this size, where the reaction is taking place and we now, uh, let's say this lid is like a movable piston and we push down on it. So we are decreasing the volume. We're not allowing any stuff to escape. Let's say we cut the volume in half. Well, all of the stuff that is in here, A, B, and C is gonna be coming into contact 
more frequently. Uh, and this increase in pressure is, let's say, not going to necessarily be stable if the atmospheric pressure is one, which normally it is. So what's going to happen is that the reaction is going to shift towards the side that has fewer moles on it. Now on the reactant side, we can see that we have two moles of gas A and one mole of gas B. This gives us three moles of reactant total. On the product side, we only have one mole of product, giving us also one mole total. So if we decrease the pressure, uh, or decrease the volume, and we increase the pressure, increase pressure, what we end up seeing is that this reaction is going to shift, according to Le Chatelier's principle, to alleviate that stress, right? We want to relieve the stress. And if we are going to relieve the stress, the reaction is going to end up uh, going from reactant to product, where these reactants are now going to come together. And we can almost imagine that C, structurally speaking, is going to be a combination of like two A's and one B molecule. So gases that previously took up more space are going to be able to condense down in this state and take up, take up less space. All right, so this is an example of Le Chatelier's principle as being affected by changes in pressure and volume. All right, so last but not least, class, we are going to consider what happens when you change the temperature of your reaction, and how does this uh, shift the equilibrium balance? How is this going to affect the reversible reaction? So when it comes to temperature, we're going to introduce the concept more uh, you know, qualitatively, and then we're going to look, mathematically speaking, at why this assumption is going to end up being true in all cases. We're not going to work through any you know, quantitative calculations. Like I said, I'm tired. I just want to be looking at this qualitatively. How do we predict shifts in the uh, reversible reaction, the nature of the reversible reaction based on these terms? So first, uh, let's introduce this qualitatively. Then we will talk a little bit quantitatively, but we're not going to get into any uh, specific mathematic calculations. So we can consider heat. Uh, as a product of an exothermic reaction, right? Since according to an exothermic reaction, heat is produced. And as a reactant in an endothermic reaction, since the endothermic process, heat is absorbed. And what this is going to do for us, how this is going to be useful, is that if the temperature of reaction changes, we can treat this, ideologically speaking, uh, in the same way as a concentration change. In other words, we can explain the shift of the reversible reaction, which direction it's going to spontaneously move in, uh, in much the same way as we described the concentration changes using our Hot Wheels cars. Okay, so if we are looking at this hypothetical, you know, example problem where we're looking at an endothermic reaction, we have added heat as a reactant here as a result. Well, what's going to happen, let's say, if we decrease the heat, uh, decrease the temperature surrounding this reaction? Now, I am going to try and keep my language as explicitly clear since heat and temperature are not the same thing. These things are not equal. However, we have learned that temperature is proportional to heat, that these two things behave in lockstep with each other. So we're going to say that if we decrease temperature, we are going to also be affecting the heat proportionally. We can decrease the heat if we are decreasing the temperature. Now, if we imagine the situation again with our kind of Hot Wheels car analogy, where originally, let's say the system was at equilibrium, the reaction was uh, progressing in a very stable balance between product and reactant ratios, we have now decreased the temperature, we're decreasing the heat of this endothermic reaction. Well, what this means is that our balance now is going to be destabilized, right? We have lowered the track of the reactant side, and our little Hot Wheels car is going to shift down the hill, which is going to make this little Hot Wheels car more stable. The shift also is going to, again, tell us which direction the spontaneous reaction will progress in to reach a new equilibrium. This Hot Wheels car shifting to the left tells us that if we decrease the heat of an endothermic reaction, then the reaction will shift toward reactants. All right, and ideologically speaking, we can follow this through if we are increasing the heat of an endothermic reaction or if we're even comparing uh, 
the situation to an exothermic reaction, increasing and decreasing the heat, we're going to be looking, conceptually speaking, at this Hot Wheels car ideology. This will tell us consistently which direction our uh, exothermic or endothermic reaction will shift if it's going to progress spontaneously towards products to rebalance and relieve stress, according to Le Chatelier's principle, or if it is going to go backwards towards the reactant side, which is exactly uh, in this example that we saw here. Okay, so why does this work though? Why are we able to assume heat as a reactant or a product as we just did? So let's look at this a little bit mathematically speaking. So we're, uh, and then we can tie the idea to the exothermic and the endothermic reactions kind of provided down below. So there are a couple of equations that we have learned that are going to help us to understand these uh, equations that I have laid out here. The first equation that we uh, are going to look at or re-examine is the equation that zero is equal to your standard Gibbs free energy plus RT natural log of K. Well, in this equation, we can see uh, an explicit uh, you know, quantitative link between our equilibrium constant and our free energy. So something uh, or an equation that we learned back in chapter 14 that gives us a connection then between Gibbs free energy and the enthalpy, which is where this heat concept comes in, uh, is the equation that our Gibbs free energy is equal to enthalpy of reaction minus T delta S naught of reaction. So if we take our Gibbs free energy equation here and substitute the enthalpy minus T delta S in for our Gibbs free energy here, we are going to be able to algebraically rearrange and solve for the equalities that are up above. So our first equality that is presented, we have solved for, like solved explicitly for our equilibrium constant. So here we have a way to be able to calculate what is our equilibrium constant if we know Gibbs free energy. Now we have looked at uh, a version of this equation already when the other day we were solving for a problem or solving for the, Gibb, uh, the equilibrium constant using Gibbs free energy, we algebraically rearranged our variables to solve for K this way. So this is the first equation we're looking at. Now the second version of it here on the right hand side, we've taken our Gibbs free energy piece and have substituted for the uh, enthalpy minus T delta S. We have inserted that into the exponent here. We've uh, reshuffled a little bit, kind of split the uh, denominator. So we have an RT on the left and just an R, a constant on the right. Now what this is gonna do for us uh, is enable us now to look at an explicit connection between enthalpy, which is right here, the exothermic versus endothermic nature of a reaction and K. So this is what we're going to be looking at in the example down below. Uh, explicitly, we are going to be looking at the proportionality of our equilibrium constant, specifically to the enthalpy of your reaction, specifically the negative enthalpy, since we have a negative sign here, all divided by T. Now, this is not to say that we can just straight up calculate equilibrium constant this way, but if we observe the rest of the terms in the exponent, either entropy, which has uh, no explicit link to the enthalpy of our reaction or the gas constant R is a constant. So we're going to ignore those factors uh, and just look at the proportional balance between our equilibrium constant K and our enthalpy. So in an exothermic reaction, uh, we have heat being released, right? We have classically represented this uh, as a delta H that is negative. So if we come down to this proportional idea uh, and we insert this negative delta H in for a negative delta H here, what we end up with is a positive delta H. And now we have a way to look at how changing the temperature, which is right here, is going to affect our equilibrium balance. Because unlike in the concentration case or the pressure volume case, where disturbing the equilibrium was just disturbing concentration, concentrations needed to shift or pressures needed to shift to now re-meet, our equilibrium constant requirement, when you change temperature, you are changing the constant itself, right? One of the variables that we laid out at the very beginning is that your equilibrium constant is constant so long as you're not changing temperature. Well, now we actually have a way to describe if you change temperature, what happens to K and how does this affect the balance of your reversible reaction? So in this first case, where again, we're looking at an exothermic reaction where your delta H is negative, this negative and negative cancel to become a positive. Now, if you increase your temperature, 
what we would be able to mathematically gather since we have a one over T up in an exponent, we're increasing this temperature. What we end up doing is decreasing the value of K. Now, what that means to our reaction, since K is a balance of product over reactant, if your K is decreasing, what this means mathematically speaking is that your denominator is going to be getting bigger. In other words, if you increase the temperature of a reversible reaction that is exothermic, the reaction is going to be shifting towards the reactant side, which according to our Hot Wheels analogy is also what we would expect to see, right? The, let's say in this hypothetical equation where we have two hydrogens and an oxygen coming together to create water and releasing heat, if we were to increase the temperature of this exothermic reaction, according to the Hot Wheels analogy, we would expect the Hot Wheels car to move to the left towards the reactants. This ideology is consistent with the math that actually allows it to be true. If you increase the temperature of an exothermic reaction that is reversible, your K value will decrease, meaning that your reactant factor must increase. Now the opposite is also true. If we look at the endothermic case, where our delta H is positive, which means that the negative sign in front of the delta H would have also remained as a negative sign, right? A positive value being multiplied by a negative value leaves the negative sign. If we increase the temperature here, we don't see a decrease in K. Mathematically speaking, we see an increase in K. Now, if we see an increase in K, according to the balance of product to reactant, we don't see reactant increasing. We see reactant decreasing. In other words, we see product increasing or increasing. And again, this is what we would expect to see. If we increase the temperature of an endothermic reaction, we're increasing that heat factor, which is going to allow, according to Le Chatelier's principle, our reaction to shift towards products. So even though we didn't plug in any explicit numbers to any of these equations up above, we can see that mathematically speaking, uh, the math is going to work out according to the enthalpy component of our uh, equation to solve for the equilibrium constant, the math also works out for us to be able to make this Hot Wheels analogy in the first place. So whether you think of the shift in Le Chatelier's principle according to temperature more qualitatively using our Hot Wheels cars, or if looking at the numbers or the equations more mathematically uh, helps you out a little bit more, you have either one of these tools at your disposal to be able to predict which, re or which way a reaction that is reversible will shift according to changes in temperature. All right, and with that, we are in the home stretch. So we really are wrapping up chapter 16 here, but before we totally finish the lecture and I give you guys you know, some suggested problems to work through when it comes to Le Chatelier's principle, I want to lay out what the rest of our semester is going to look like based off of the foundation that we have laid here in chapter 16, corresponding to all of the equilibrium concentrations, calculations, uh, constants, <laughs> dynamic, uh, reversible reactions, everything. So everything we've talked about here is the launching point for the rest of our semester, well, we, uh, where we have three topics left to talk about. First, we are going to be returning to solubility. If we think back to chapter nine in the fall semester, which was a very long time ago, uh, we had talked about the solubility rules, how we can predict whether or not a certain compound is going to dissolve in water, what type of solution it's going to make. And we had, again, some rules that laid out whether or not uh, a uh, pr or product or a solid or something was going to be soluble or insoluble. What we're going to be returning to at the beginning of chapter 18, because yes, we're going a little out of order here, but what we'll be, we will be returning to is the gray zone. If something is partially soluble, how can we predict exactly how soluble it's going to be? Next, we are going to return to acids and bases, uh, primarily discussing reversible neutralization reactions, those that uh, take place um, in aqueous conditions, the dissoci or dissociations that take place reversibly. Um, so these would be like weak acids and weak bases. Uh, and then last but not least, we will be turning our attention to electrochemistry, which is the more advanced discussion of uh, redox reactions. Only again, the difference here is that we're going to be acknowledging the reversible reaction of some redox reactions. Uh, so each of these three topics uh, solubility, acid base, and electrochem uh, slash redox reaction stuff was first introduced in chapter nine, all of them last fall. Uh, and now we're going to be sort of mirror imaging them towards the end of this semester as well. So solubility first, 
acids, bases next, electrochemistry last, all with that reversible reaction spin. All right, but that's enough jabbering for today. Uh, so we are going to wrap up chapter 16. Again, here we have some suggested problems for you to work through uh, from the end of the chapter. And if Le Chatelier feels um, like you're, you know, you're pretty comfortable with it, I would definitely recommend that you take the time to then go back and work through some more of the calculation based uh, example problems there. Um, again, we're going to be getting a lot of practice with equilibrium calculations since we will be doing them for the rest of the semester, but the stronger your foundation, the easier the upcoming chapters and conversations will be. All right, but that is enough for today. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to uh, let me know, ask those questions. If you have homework, please double check and do your homework. But until next time, class is dismissed. <laughs>